Hey, welcome to Bull City Lawyer TV. This is part three of our H2B series where we're talking about 9142B. If you followed our last couple of videos, we started with an introductory video to the H2B visa process. Our last video was on the prevailing wage determination. That was your first big step. This is your second big step. It's exciting. Super exciting. So if that sounds good to you, stick around. So what is your 9142B? This is where you are trying to gain approval from the Department of Labor. So exciting. You're gonna do this through, obviously, the 9142B form. So you're gonna do your 9142 through the ICERT portal. This is the Department of Labor's website that allows you to electronically fill out this document and submit it. Yeah, and it's not really complicated to do, but it does take some learning. And the 9142 itself it's not too complicated. You're gonna fill out a lot of boilerplate information, a lot of which you put in your 9141, including your business, the job description, a lot of it's a copy. And that's again, just to reiterate, that's where the 9141 doing a good job on that initial step, which was we said in the last video, seems easy, it becomes really important and it's going to follow you all the way through. So if you're working through iCERT, you'll notice you have several tabs. It looks like there are you know, 10, 12, 15 steps. Steps one through 12, pretty easy. Like we said, that's where you're just filling out your information. But as you'll notice, when you get towards the end, it will say, upload your attachments. And this is where things get really spicy. When it says upload attachments, it doesn't mean one or two attachments. You're looking at hundreds of pages. Boom. You might've seen this in the first video in the series. I think this statement of need is, I don't know, 200, 250 pages. This isn't even a complete one, this was a draft. That's pretty standard. We usually work with them around 150 to 350 pages, just depending on the business, how many contracts, how many payroll records we can include. I think the longest one to date was 312. 312, that was kind of a beefy one. It really, it helped that that company had great records of their contracts. Yeah, and that was just a statement of need, right? So that's not the full, by the time you upload all the attachments, that ends up being a 400 page application. In addition to this awesome statement of need, there's also a list of other documents you're gonna have to attach. This includes assigned appendix B, your prevailing wage determination, that's your 9141 we discussed in the last video, a job order. This job order must also be sent to your state workforce agency. If you don't know who you're going to hire, you're going to want to deal with a recruiter. So that's it. And the yeah. statement of need. Oh well, yeah. Well, which we already talked about. So it's like five things. So, you know, just four or five documents, including a 200, 300, 400 no big page deal. statement of need. So what happens if things don't go as expected? This is a critical question because when you're dealing with the Department of Labor, you need to expect that you will receive several, not just one, notices of deficiency, which used to be called request for evidence. It sounded a lot nicer when it was request for evidence. It was so much nicer. Notice of deficiency makes you feel deficient. Right. And it kind of makes you lose respect for yourself and then you go and cry in a corner at home or underneath your desk in the office. Now, if you're lucky, your notice of deficiency is just, maybe you put the wrong county down for your business address. Maybe you didn't capitalize your name. If you're unlucky, then your entire temporary statement of need is considered a bunch of crap. Basically. And they want you to rewrite it. And at that point, you're already out uh, quite a bit of money. The notice of deficiency, the key in responding is that you have to respond fast because this process doesn't go on forever. There's actually a final deadline for responding to the notice, for getting through all of the possible notice of deficiencies that can happen. And so it's critical that you be able to respond at the same day. I mean, I'm talking about you get it in your email at 10 a.m. in the morning from, you know, TLS Chicago, right? That's their email. You'll get T familiar. TLC Chicago. TLC right? Chicago, yeah. right? You'll get very familiar with it. It's critical that you be able to respond the same day or at the very latest the next morning because 
you have to plan that you'll get other notices of deficiency. And again, you're along this big time clock where you're trying to get your workers at a certain date and every time there's a notice of deficiency and you take too long to respond, it's eating into the time that you bring your workers in. Temporary labor certification is a big deal because now when you've, you've got one more step in the Department of Labor process, but after that, you send in that temporary certification to USCIS, who for the most part defers the Department of Labor. Only in very exceptional circumstances, about one application usually per cycle will USCIS overrule the Department of Labor. So in other words, this whole step, the 9142 step, is the most critical in the process and you've just gotten through it at this point, so congratulations. That being said, there is one more thing you gotta do before we go to USCIS. Domestic recruiting. Domestic recruiting can be a little messy at times, but it's not that bad. You have to place two ads. The ads have to run on concurrent days in your local newspaper. That's a Sunday, always a Sunday, and either a Monday or a Saturday. It's always cheaper to go Sunday, Monday. These ads, they have to follow your prevailing wage determination where you describe the job. There's a list of requirements in the code lays it out exactly what has to be in your ad to make it. And it can get tricky. I mean, the code is pretty extensive and it's easy to get tripped up. I think there are about 20 rules for, for the ad. There are, and they are not in the instructions that you get with the temporary labor certification. So you do actually have to look at the code, right? The CFR code for H2B to kind of get through it. Another good reason probably to get someone to help you with this. And as you're doing it, you're going to look at the code you're gonna look at your ad and you're just gonna keep adding into your ad. That's where costs really pile up. Keep adding into your ad. ADD into your AD. Yes. And these newspaper companies, they charge you for every word you've added into your ad. So, in addition to your newspaper ad, the good part is the other ad you're required to place is your state workforce agency ad, it's free. It's free. You don't have to pay per word. If you want to make this thing a thousand words, you can. But. But. Why would you? Why would you? All you need to do is follow the code. Follow the code. Make your ad. Like a ninja. Or a samurai. Samurai code. Ninjas don't have a code. I, is it samurai? I'm, I'm unsure of this. Okay. Okay. No, it's not really my area of expertise. I took Icelandic blood feuds in law school. I did not take samurai blood feuds, but I'm sure it's the same. Do we have a bubble that says not a real course? Blood feuds is, but samurai oh, okay. is not. We did not, go, can, we did not go to the same law school. Um, I took Viking law, essentially. It was great. Okay. I know everything we've given you today can be a little confusing. Including Viking law. There are a lot of steps. You've got the 9142, you've got the iCERT portal, your ads that are going to the newspaper, your ads that are going to a website, Aha! your 300-page statement of need. It's a confusing step. Receiving your certification from the Department of Labor, it's a big deal, it's, it's complicated, but once you get it, you got it. Things are looking up. You're, you're, you are 90% you are kind of through it at that point. But, you're not done. Just because you've received it doesn't mean your job is over. Doesn't mean the Department of Labor is just going to forward it to CIS and you can sit back and wait on one response. You have to file a new application that's 40 pages. That's called I-129. That's the subject of our next video. We'll get into it next week. If you've enjoyed the series so far, stick around. We'll be putting up a new video very soon that's going to cover the last step called the I-129. If you have any H2B questions, we are a real law firm. We're located in Durham, North Carolina. We do work throughout the Southeast. We do H2Bs nationally. Just give us a call. Check us out on our website at bullcity.lawyer. If you've enjoyed this video, this series, or you just have interest in immigration law, subscribe to our channel. It's going to be a lot of good content coming in the weeks. And it's not just immigration law, by the way. We also do legal technology. We do a lot of coding ourselves. Citizenship.law is uh, an app, essentially, that we've built out. And our tagline is immigration lawyers who code. Like us, subscribe to us, share us. It really helps us out and lets us know we're doing a good job or a bad job. 
All right. All right. Thanks. <laughs>